Breaking the cycle to step forward. Authentic conversations from lived experience and a professional perspective in overcoming abuse with Chris Tuck and Beverly Ann. Hello and welcome to Breaking the Cycle to Step Forward podcast. And this podcast is with not one, but two special guests. My name's Beverly Ann, and I am co hosting today's episode with. Hi, everyone. It's Chris Tuck here again. And I'm always a co host, as I say, every session. Who <laughs> seems to forget that? <laughs> and today's lovely guest, first of all, is Emily. Hi. And also her lovely mum, Kathy. Hi. And for any of you watching today on video, you may actually recognise their voice. And we're going to share a little um, bit of background about how we've actually met and how they've come to be guests today. And if you're listening, you won't be left out because we will add a link to the programme that you um, can see them in. So, Chris, first of all, you were the person who first saw a documentary on Channel 4 called Paedophile in My Family, Surviving Dad. I did indeed, and I'm always drawn to watch these kinds of programmes purely because of our own experiences and always wanting to learn more about other people's experiences, how they survived it, what their relationships are like with um, the caregivers around them, if they're still in their space, and also looking at the impact of the trauma on all areas of their lives and how they recovered or are recovering. So I'm always drawn to those kind of documentaries because of my own lived experience and what I can learn from other people. So from there, obviously, I blogged about it because... I was just blown away by Emily Victoria and her mum, their relationship, the ups and downs, what what I learned from their programme. And I was just, as I said, blown away. So I wrote a blog. I put it up on all my social media, as I do, because that's what I've been doing for 10 years. Um, and then I got invited by Channel 4 to attend Emily Victoria's um, launch almost of the programme. And then obviously I'm like, oh, can I bring a friend, please? And that friend happened to be you, Bev. So that's how we got to go to Channel 4 and meet these lovely two people. And at Channel 4, which was amazing, we didn't know what to expect. When we got there, it was a small viewing. I think there were no more than 65 people in the viewing, and that included the production team, the NSPCC, uh, Jess Phillips MP was there, and there was a Q&A afterwards. So it was and I am going to say wonderful, and some of our listeners and viewers watching this will be thinking, how can you say wonderful when you're seeing something like that? But for me, it was uh, such an informative programme, and it gave a different viewpoint to what we've had in the past and different insight. Um, and getting to actually watch it again in that scenario and see you in person. I mean, I am gushing. I'm not going to pretend I'm not. I'm gushing. Just gave it another level and depth. And, you know, I am so pleased that Chris put it out on social media because we felt very grateful to be there. And then following there, um, obviously got to give you a hug, which was I like doing that after years of not wanting any contact, um, actually got to meet you again down here in, I was going to say sunny Brighton, but it's not so sunny this summer, unfortunately, uh, which was even special. So thank you. And thank you for agreeing to come on here. So mm -hmm. as, and um, as we said, we're going to do this as a normal conversation, as most people know. So we're going to start right at the beginning. And when I say beginning, the beginning of the journey of this together and and all of the journey is challenging. But this is one part that most people find particularly challenging. And some people don't actually get the opportunity to share either or be able to find the words. So if you're ready to share, Emily, just like a little bit of an insight as to what was it, what was the, you know, the moment, what went through your mind 
as you're about to reveal to your mum, was it something that you prepared yourself for? Did it just come out? We're, we're very interested to hear. Mm, it's a really good and important question. And um, <clears throat> it was a bit of a surreal moment. And at the time, it kind of just happened in a, in a haze, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I was abused from my earliest memory being a toddler all the way till I was 18 um, by my dad and mum's husband at the time. And um, during that time, I didn't feel like I could speak out. I was terrified of him. Behind closed doors, he was a very violent man. So there was the violence and emotional manipulation as well as the sexual abuse. Um, and it combined itself into an invisible prison around me. Um, as part of my journey, other children came into the picture. So um, my dad was to the outside world a very popular person. And um, um, to mum, he was a loving husband, without putting words in your mouth, mum, uh, a loving <laughs> husband at the time. And, um, and then because of this persona he put out, he was actually granted the honour of being a foster carer, a main foster carer. And um, that was really scary for me because I didn't want him to hurt any other children. So growing up, I very much put myself in the line of fire whenever I could sense that he was going to attack again. And I wanted to protect the other children. But because uh, some people might say, well, why didn't you just speak out, you know, and, and that could have stopped it. But he was so scary. And I did fear for mum's life and other, the other children's life if I was to speak out. So what I did instead was keep quiet and just protect the other children by trying to get in the way. Um, an example of that might be he'd ask me to go for a walk with the dogs or he'd ask one of them to go for a walk with the dogs. And I'll say, I'll go, I'll go, because I didn't want him to attack them in any private one-on-one -on -one contact. And then what happened when I turned 18 is I realised um, through a couple of situations that he might have been hurting some of the younger children. And one of those moments was a girl was treating him in a very sort of caring way, almost as if she felt responsible for his feelings and carrying the burden of him. And um, I, I think a lot of survivors um, and, and victims who are watching this will, will understand that you end up feet carrying a lot of their emotional weight as well. And when I saw that, I, a kind of red flag went up in my mind and then I spoke to some of the other children and, and one person said that um, dad had abused them. So at that moment, um, I thought, right, the only way to protect them is actually to get dad away from the situation. Um, but it was still very, very scary. So I kind of was building myself up to it. I actually went on the NSPCC website, looked at other survivor stories, which is why this podcast and lots of other things are really important for survivors and survivors who are family members as well, um, because it gives you confidence and makes you not feel alone. And um, so I was building up the confidence. I also had evidence I was storing away against him that could be given to the police. Um, and then a day came when he took me to London to see um, some family friends um, and he got very, very drunk and passed out on the sofa. And because he was passed out, I felt safe enough to, to speak out to the two friends that were there at the time. And one of them happened to be like an older sister to me. She was, I've known her since I was a baby. And and it was all a bit of a blur, to be honest. And then I woke up the next day feeling very scared. And um, I was really worried about how it would make mum feel, um, whether I'd be safe and, and all of those things. So at this point, I think um, our memories slightly differ because um, I can't quite remember how mum found out. I know that 
I remember the moment I said it to her out of my mouth and she and she came to this house she drove all the way to London um and she arrived and we were up in a bedroom um with uh the family friends and mum dad was nowhere near and um I said to her um something along the lines of dad's been abusing me yeah and mum leapt into action to protect me and the other children when she found out and that was the moment that it kind of all started to unravel and change and get towards safety but I do think it's worth mum just taking a step back and telling you about when she first heard and her process in that because um I'm grateful I'm lucky I know that sounds silly but I'm lucky because my mum believed me my mum supported me my mum put all her own needs aside. Can you imagine finding all this stuff out along with a lot of, a load of other stuff that she found out at the time? And her world was crashing inside her, but you wouldn't have known it. She put put mine and the other children's safety first. And for that I'm then eternally grateful. Um and, yeah, I'd love mums to give her perspective because it's so important. Absolutely. And before we move on to you, Kathy, I just want to say, Emily, thank you. And you said quite a few things that um there's quite a few myths. Like, I just want to go back and when you said, you know, how you're protecting the others mm -hmm. and how you would go for that walk, because it's a misconception sometimes. Even my husband, you know, has sometimes had to, um, his, his own preconceptions of what abuse is and when it happens. And it's often those innocent moments, like going for a walk, that can be the time it happens and people don't realize also the you know why didn't you tell anyone you're a child you know adults find it hard to talk about abuse and yet there's this onus put onto children why haven't you spoken and the responsibility so I just want to say thank you for sharing that so eloquently Chris is there anything that you want to bring in at the moment um, can't wait to hear from Kathy, but yeah, look, I'm I'm writing as <laughs> as you're speaking. Um, yeah, protecting others. That's what comes up time and time again. Yeah. Beverly and myself. I'm the eldest girl. I yeah. stepped in and took it for the others. The difference between our story and yours is that my mum was present not in the sexual abuse, but when the mental abuse was going on, when the physical abuse was going on. And she even walked in on my sister when my sister was being abused and didn't protect. So the fact that your mum, Kathy, is sitting there and the fact that you've just said to mum, thank you. I mean, we all would expect a parent, a caregiver, if they saw anything, if they hear anything, if they're being told something, that they would just step up and do it. But in many circumstances and cases, it just doesn't happen like that. So it's good to get both perspectives. And also, you know, mum protected me, mum believed me, mum supported me. That is what should happen. Thank you, Kathy, for being the one that's done that. And hopefully we will send out a clear message to other caregivers that that is their role in life and you know, um, no one wants to hear that their child has been sexually abused. No one. But that is how you deal with it when you are told. So thank you. Um, I think we need to listen to Cathy. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. So thank you so much again, Emily, because we do appreciate the generosity in sharing your experiences and your story. Um, and, and it is your story and it's so important to share, but also... You know, it's about looking after yourself too. So we just want to say thank you. So Kathy, now, um, we are all smiling because, you know, it's a message that we want other people when they're seeing it to be able to hear it. And I don't want that to in any way minimise the impact of this. And it's something we've spoken about in the past in our podcast. You know, how can you speak about these things while you're smiling? But it's part and parcel of it as well. So. I assume you will have received a phone call from the family friend. Firstly, thank you for that sort of brief um, 
discussion with Emily because it gave me time to compose myself because I was getting really emotional. So I can oh, speak okay. again now. Uh, and thank <laughs> you for your honesty. And so just know, for, yeah. no, no, um, just know you have all the time in the world. Yeah. So, so I had a phone call, and uh, it was not from you. It was from Elizabeth. Was it from yeah. Elizabeth? Yeah. So she rang me and said that um, I needed to come up because Emily had told her that my ex had been abusing her. Mm -hmm. And some things just happened to me. And I, I can't explain this. A psychologist would do this much better, I think. But I literally went into functional mode. I didn't take on board really what had been said as in trying to process that or knowing that I should try to process it my immediate reaction was Emily's not safe yeah I need to get my child safe and at that point I have Emily's siblings as well and so I um I called a friend and I'm grateful to him for every day of my life moving forward that he stepped up all I said was that there was something going on in London and I needed his help because my ex was drunk and I couldn't deal with him and I had to get Emily out of the house. Mm -hmm. So bless him, he, he turned up and we drove up. I took the, obviously my other children with me because I couldn't leave them anywhere else yeah. um, and arrived. And that's when I walked into the house. Um, he was drunk as Emily says, and you were upstairs. And I went upstairs and was right upstairs. And that's when you told me and again, I still couldn't process the words of what was being said. I just wanted to, I wanted to escape actually with you at that point. And um, so um, I came downstairs and, and he'd then woken up and he was absolutely vile to me. The language was outstanding. I'm not even going to use the language, but I got Emily out of the house and her, her um, siblings. And I just said to my friend, please sort him out. I don't want him near the house. I don't, you take him home. I don't want anywhere near me. He's um, so out of order. I think it's worth mentioning that mum didn't tell him or confront him in no. the way that he, he wasn't told that everybody knew at this point. No. Because from a strategic point of view, the group decided that in order to get us safe, um, it would be better to do that quickly and then have a strategy to trying to get him um brought to justice yeah so my, my thinking at that point wasn't even about that that came a little bit later but my point at the time is you, you don't have a conversation with somebody who's drunk and I didn't want to have any conversation yeah. with them after what I'd heard it's the last thing I wanted to do yeah so um I left my friend stayed there and got him back to his place and um then after that um the police were in, police involved and um, when they say the, work, the rug's pulled out from under your feet, I know what that means. Because yeah. one day it's a one day and the next day it's a completely different world you're in. And uh, I was just functioning from one thing to another. I, um, I don't know how much detail to really go into here, um, but there was just so many things you have to navigate, like um, the police, the police coming. Um, the police searching your home and everything else, the Emily's um, siblings having to be interviewed in, under caution, having social services come in to make sure that you're okay to, you know, to have children, to have people assess you if, if from your psychological perspective to be saying you're perfectly fine when my world's crumbled around. So many different things to navigate. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, as well as trying to um, understand that you're now... Um, a, a, a parent on your own with all the other feelings and I and I can remember one day um I don't know which day I can't remember the sequencing now but I can remember sitting by the radiator in my lounge and I knew that day that if somebody could it couldn't explain to me get my brain to understand how this could have happened to me this is this is me starting to try to process the news now um that I knew that I wouldn't be there at the end of the day. And that wasn't because I was suicidal, but my body, my brain was shutting down. It was getting smaller and smaller. And I don't understand it myself. It's like getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I just knew somebody had to explain it. So bless them, the police 
came over and they sat with me for hours just talking me through how these things could happen. So my brain was able to start to function again. And be, and I, I can remember just, it was like my emotions stepped out over here. I thought, I can't deal with you. Too much else to deal with. You can stay there and sit there for as long as you need to sit there because I've got much more important things to, <laughs> to, to focus on. And that intervention by the police was um, life-saving for me yeah. to help me there to start again and I had loads of friends who stepped up and um, came in and you know just made me do the practical things like um, you know mortgage and and just things but yeah. also going on also going on around this of course was at the moment my ex was with somebody else who didn't know what was going on I had said nothing and um the, the police obviously had to come and gather evidence and there was a process to go through to get evidence before an arrest could be made. Mm -hmm. And I had to try to keep life as normal as possible during that wow. time. Difficult. You know, receiving phone calls, receiving texts. Every time I got one, I, I had to kind of fake it and then I'd go into a meltdown and I'd ring the police going, have I just mucked it all up? You know, because... I don't know, I didn't know how to navigate this at all. And um, I just had to try to keep it as normal as possible. I just I kept saying, you can't come back to the house. I said, your behavior was disgusting. And you know, it's like, I just had to do that. And then um, there was lots of stuff which go on, which I won't go into in too much detail here, but then the evidence was gathered to a certain level, which was enabled him to be arrested. And the arrest happened at my friend's place. And I feel so guilty for that because I hadn't prepared this person for that. And, you know, it it destroyed him as well at that point because it was such an unexpected piece of news. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, he still remains a good friend and stepped up and everything else during that process. Um, but I just don't, I don't know how your, your body chooses to work that way, but I just knew I had to, my first priority was safety, not the news. And then the news came in stages to me afterwards, understanding it. And and that took months, years probably, to gradually yeah. understand it and feel it and process it myself. Mm -hmm. Thank Can you, I just Kathy. come in here, Bev, sorry, um, and just sort of like say that whole um, acting as normal whilst all of this is going on in the background, you know, keeping your child safe, the police wanting to gather evidence, you carrying on as normal, but you can't. You're disassociating, you're putting your emotions away, you're, you're literally disassociating because that's the only way you can get through things like this and function. Now, my dad was also a convicted paedophile, but he didn't abuse me sexually, he abused other people within the family. And um, the day that he got arrested, I knew nothing about. I came home from school with my two younger brothers and um, I've got, seven stepsisters and one natural sister and they want at home so usually family life is really busy in that house um but I came home with my two younger brothers and my dad was on the sofa reading a, a magazine a book whatever but he was reading and I was just like you knew something wasn't right because the family wasn't there um, and then all of a sudden we were in for about five ten minutes asking dad you know where is everyone and then all of a sudden, the police are knocking at the door, shouting, you know, please, please, rushing in to the house to arrest him. And for me, that was a real shock to me as a child to see that. And so I can only imagine what your good friend felt like when that arrest yeah. happened, because it's not a nice thing to see um, or experience. But at the same time, it's that element of surprise that the police need to arrest the perpetrator because otherwise the perpetrator is going to disappear, you mm. know. So I don't know of any other way of them doing it. And it's called the knock now. It's called the knock. That's what they call it. And they're, they're trying to find out different ways of doing those kind of arrests so that it doesn't traumatise other people that might just be part of the scene but not part of the, you know, the actual issue. Um, because it's re-triggering and re-traumatising for everybody. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to throw that in there, really. Hand over back to Bev. 
and thank you, Chris, and and thank you, Kathy. And when either of you talking, I, like I'm in it with you, and I don't know, you know, everyone else listening, mm -hmm. you know, that they must be in it as well as they're listening to you. And thank you for your honesty. What's going on with your body is your body is actually in trauma and survival mode, and it's something that, you no, know, once we we look back, we can see how our body's reacting, and it just shows the strength, you know. And and Emily, you know, some of those things that your mum's talking about about how your body reacts must also resonate with yourself as a survivor. And I'm saying that as one survivor to another. Look at that disassociation, you know, your emotions being pushed down. So thank you for verbalising and when I, when I met verbalising my, that. When I met my, um, my husband now, the first time he ever gave me a hug, my body stopped shaking and I didn't realise it was shaking on the inside. It was like there was an actual vibration and it was noticeable. Yeah. It stopped my, I had no idea it was there. Yeah and it because it becomes your norm you know and and even when you're trying to recall things there's some things you can't recall that you know it's it's been filed away thank you very much i don't want to revisit that so thank you um chris is, what would you like to say there you've got your hand um, up yeah i just want to go back over something for, before we progress i think i just wanted to pick up upon the behind the closed doors um conversation um where all the abuse was happening behind closed doors no one knows what's going on behind closed doors and socially out in public the lovely husband you know the 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 gregarious man bev and i have talked about this before about our own parents everyone loved that persona outside of the house but when that persona was behind the closed doors that's when they showed obviously their true selves and um yeah it comes up time and time again that it's almost like this Jacqueline and Hyde kind of figure that is the perpetrator of the abuse. Um, but how he ever became a foster carer. Oh, scary. It is scary. It's scary. Very yeah. scary. I do think I do think that um a lot of perpetrators try and get into positions where they have access to children. Um, and that's the reality. And I know people sometimes shy away from that, but it's um, the reality that they want to be foster carers, teachers, scout, officers. scout leaders, yeah. all of those different types of roles which give them access to children. And obviously it's changed slightly with the online world. There's additional dangers there with catfishing and all, all of those types of scenarios. But, um, yeah, it's, it's about, I suppose it's difficult for social services to be able to find good people that are looking after children in the right way. But I, even to this day, I know of um, a single man who wants to adopt a child and is obsessed with, with it. And um, I did go to a barbecue where his friend, a friend of his, was like, I only relate to children. So a red flag went up about this other person. But then my mind's thinking, well, why does this other person not want to wait for a relationship to have a child? Now, of course, maybe he just wants to be a dad. But at the back of my mind, I also think, well, maybe he doesn't. I don't, I don't know, because I've seen both good and evil in this world. And so I think that us working together you know working with government the mandatory reporting Della's law mm -hmm. all of those things actually come into practice across different organizations like social services improving communication across services between police and social services for example that can actually empower somebody working day to day to employ the right kind of people and understand the red flags when when there seemingly aren't any yeah, and, and the hardest thing with this conversation, let's be frank, you know, nobody wants to talk about abuse, you know, given a choice, nobody wants to be sitting here having these challenging conversations, but you didn't have a choice as a child, Chris didn't have a choice, I didn't have a choice, no child is has a choice to be in that place in the first, first stages, um, so as adults, 
we believe that it's forget how difficult it is as adults we have a right to uh, not even just a right okay. but a duty is the word i'm looking for to be proactive and prevent where we can and be aware because we can't always prevent we can't always stop but be aware and and be open you know and thank you to you Kathy for listening but also to your friend who listened to Emily right you know right the first time because that's huge and the fact that she was able to to phone you and not dismiss it you know that's so important I think um you know they say it takes a community to raise a child and it takes a community to help a, a victim into a survivor and um, help you survive, especially during those first difficult months and years and ongoing. And I think um, mum's journey in that process was really tough, but she did what was right. And I, it shouldn't, nobody should hide behind what's easy. They need to do what's right, especially in that situation. And I think a lot of uh, mum's like forgotten mum represents like the forgotten people like the forgotten family and friends mm -hmm. behind me as a victim and survivor you know she was a victim in her own way in a different way yeah and I think that actually what needs to be spoken about as much as empowering survivors is actually empowering family and friends and they need more support as well because without my mum I doubt I would have been able to survive so yeah. it really is a community working together and we have this beautiful thing now we have a relationship and we rebuilt our family and we've rebuilt friends and we rebuild that community despite what yes. my dad did to us and I think that no matter how difficult something is you can get to this wonderful place and that is inspiring and for anybody who is in a dark moment whether they they're just going through the shock of the PTSD or they're getting re-triggered at a moment in those dark moments just know hold on and, and work together and you can get to a really good place and it's so worth it <laughs> well, absolutely I would say, what I'll say is along the journey Emily had you know she made me sit down and listen to um lots of things I still know very little of all of the abuse which um my ex um you know put on Emily she doesn't want me to know all of that necessarily mm -hmm. but there's things which she made me sit and listen and I and again instinctively and I don't know how where this instinct comes from but I knew that I had to just take that at that time and you know even though I wanted to respond with my my view of the situation of what she was describing I knew that if I'd spoken at that time that would have shut the door the communication would have stopped and it was really hard to hear a lot of things yeah. really hard to take but again I just knew it was right to do and I had you know I had um some friends I could talk to and um, <laughs> call in the middle of the night when I needed them, when I was, you know, crying into my bed and everything else, and um, and to kind of help me navigate me through this journey as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and I know, Chris, you're you're itching to say something. I'm just going to sneak one in very quickly. Emily, what about your? I mean, you had the wonderful support from your mum, but as we know, survivors, your mum's just eloquently said there are some things you've not told her, and absolutely there are some things personally I will never speak about because that that box is shut thank you very much even in with a, a professional but f for you at that time when it that's that no man's land time you've revealed there's everything going on there's the investigation who else did you have to support you um I expect a lot of people would have thought they were around me and supporting me. So I do apologise if anybody thinks that I don't mention them um, because at the time I was just trying to survive. Um, and in that moment, I think one of my childhood friends, and I only had two childhood friends because dad didn't allow me to have friends, um, 
and one of those friends was Joanna who you see in the documentary yeah. um she helped me she helped me survive and we were both teenagers and she had her own stuff going on and she just she looked after me when I you know drank too much um or whatever I did in those moments to try and cope with the ocean of pain she she was right there by my side Elizabeth also stepped in and supported me um um but I have to admit despite that they were there and they helped me survive I I still felt completely alone in this journey because nobody can process that for you nobody can process those emotions um and I felt because there weren't communities of survivors then um really that I knew about um I felt so alone and I didn't know how to get through it and what I came across a lot of the time was people actually trying to bring the subject up or talk to me about it and impress on upon me their opinions and their views of the situation, which were really unhelpful and actually made me feel more shame, even yeah. though they were trying to help. Um, yeah. And I think the language of talking to survivors of sexual abuse needs to be sort of addressed and there should be some guidelines that people can go to, you know, um, a lot more easily and then for to understand those signposts of where to go but it was a very lonely time and it's it's not really been until recently that I felt like myself has been put back together and I'm now holding the hands and connected with my family and friends again because quite honestly because the abuse happened for so long um my brain as a toddler was being formed whilst I was being abused and whilst my dad was being very violent to me so I my subconscious just had um fear in built into it and lots of other things so when I became an adult I had to try and sort of like process all of that and can you imagine the amount, the amount of time it took yeah. to have to do that um so I couldn't really go to anyone for the the support to help me do that other than um you know a therapist but it was very difficult to find good therapists back then um and so it was a journey despite everyone sort of around me and that complex post-traumatic stress disorder basically meant that so many things around me could be a trigger because my dad would attack me multiple times a day every day of the week um and get me up in the middle of the night and all of those things it wasn't like I could say one song or one yes. smell was a trigger it was life um and so I actually had to for my own survival leave mum leave my friends and move away move away yeah. from everyone just for a bit because and it took a lot a, a lot to find out how to do that and get money and things it wasn't easy but the reason being is because really sadly, all those people that I cared about and were close with, they were triggers. They were the biggest triggers for me. Yeah. And um, I didn't really understand that. It was my brain, sorry. Oh, God. I think that might have been, oh, don't worry. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it, it takes time and, and a process. But the people around me like mum and Joanna they didn't take offence and they didn't get upset that I wasn't around and available to talk all the time I think they just understood and I'll be forever grateful for them giving me that space and time and then welcoming me back when they could. Yeah and I'd, I'd like to say is you know for people out there please don't think I've got this right all the time because I really really haven't you know I'd say things which for me from my upbringing my understanding from what I was saying was helpful and to Emily it was like you know why would you say that and so you know the comp some of the conversations haven't always ended up in the best way have they because you know I could put my foot in it like you do um yeah and but they were always understood I think by you and they were always understood by me even if we didn't understand quite mm. 
you know yeah um, and trauma is a funny thing because <laughs> well, that's completely the wrong way of saying yeah. it but it's a peculiar. it's a strange yeah. peculiar thing yeah. um because I knew that mum was you know trying to protect me and doing the best for me but the child in me was really angry with yeah. mum not, not protecting me how could she not have seen her little four-year-old girl crying out for her mum's protection um but of course the adult in me knows mum couldn't see it and um I didn't tell mum I didn't give mum any signs but it didn't stop the child in me still feeling like that so the child is mixed with the adult in you and in me and so I had to navigate all that and I got angry with mum and upset and questioned mum all at the same time as believing it it's it's not black and white it's extremely yeah. and getting to that sort of like sunshine out of grey is is takes time and those difficult conversations yes there was one, uh, so one, well an example which Emily gave me which will stick with me forever was when she was tiny um we lived in a, a little um two up two down house and the bedroom with the double bed in the double bed was pushed against the wall because it was the only way it would fit and I slept against the wall so when Emily would call out in the night she'd call out for mum but um because my ex was sleeping nearest to her mm. he'd go and answer that call because for me it was like calling for a parent in the night yeah but for Emily she wanted mum yeah and so you know a message for me is to really listen to what your children are saying um because if they're asking for mum there's a reason why they're asking for mum yeah um, and I miss that and 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 Kathy you know being parents we're all parents sitting here you know we look back and we've had conversations about this Chris and I you know we can look back and if we only we knew this information that we had today back then on all different aspects so we absolutely hear and feel you. There's loads I want to say, but Chris has been so patient sitting there <laughs> for ages. Go on, Chris. <laughs> There's so much I want to say, and I almost feel guilty about taking the conversation back. But um, I just want to touch on what you've just said there, Kathy. Um, I believe that you were the worker for the family. You brought in yes. the, the funds mm -hmm. to the family. So yeah. as the main breadwinner, you're going to be exhausted. And I, I'm not giving you an out card, but we can no. all understand where parents get so exhausted. And when you're in a relationship, as in you don't even think that your child is being abused, mm -hmm. of course you're going to go, oh, let Uppy sort it out. Let <laughs> them get up and sort out the children. You know, I've got to get up in the morning. I've got to go to work. So all of that is normal everyday no. life. So, you, you know, we can't throw any shade at parents who are doing that and then might miss a cue from yeah. their child saying mum. But what we can say is understanding that we don't really know potentially who our partner is and if they are abusing our children is to maybe check in once in a while, maybe just, just be aware, just have an insight because we're sharing that insight with you. So that's number one. Going back to what Emily was saying about a community to raise a child, community to help and support a victim and survivor, there's another survivor friend of mine called Sally, and she come up with the phrase that um, the three in four, i.e. the ones that are not victim and survivors, it's the three in four that need to step up and support the one in four who are abused. Yeah. So we know that child sexual abuse is more prevalent than one in four. But because no one knows the true stats, I thought that that was quite a good way for us to all sort of remember that we do need the three in four in society to step up to help and support the one in four that have gone through child sexual abuse, potentially. Um, also, you were talking about, um, Emily, about um, survivors and supporters of survivors, you know, friends and family, not understanding what to say, mm. always, you know, people putting their foot in it. Even I, with some survivors, and I am a survivor, I put my foot in it with other survivors because we don't know, like you were saying, Emily, life is a trigger. So we don't know what will trigger me, what will trigger you, what will trigger 
you know, the boy down the road. We just don't know. So we can potentially put our foot in it every, every time we open our mouths. Um, but it's the listening, the learning and the understanding of what's going on for that person if we're connected to that person and how can we respond differently and better to help um, move everything forward. But One in Four is an actual survivor's charity um, and they've written a book specifically for professionals and supporters of survivors to help with the language, to help with those conversations. So that if you go onto the One in Four website, you can buy that book. It's very, and, very good. And we'll put the link underneath as well, yeah. because what, you know, what what's coming out from your conversation is, you know, as you're saying about language, about being heard, you know, but support for everyone, because this is like a stone going into the middle of a pond and the ripple effect and the, the victims, of this crime you know because what people don't understand is the grooming of the people around their victim and then as you've said as well you know you weren't the only victim there were others and people like have this misnomer sometimes that it's only one victim mm -mm -mm. if there's one victim look closer because yeah. there'll be more there'll and be I think more when i was oh sorry carry on chris <laughs> <laughs> sorry so um Beverly intervening then actually leads me back on to the other point that I wanted to pick up on. So fabulous timing. Um, it almost seems that some victim and survivors think it's okay. Well, it's not okay, but they think internalised. If I'm the one that's being abused and I can save other people, it's all right because I'm the one that's taking the abuse it's not all right but that's what we often internalize if I'm being abused and I'm protecting other people but as soon as you find out that someone else is being abused it's almost like how dare you now I'm going to speak up I'm not saying that happens in every case but there does seem to be a pattern where some victim and survivors we feel like okay if it's only me I can deal with this but as soon as you see someone else or know of someone else that's being abused then it's just like no, this isn't all right anymore. And that almost gives you the catalyst or that little bit of fight or courage or spark, whatever you want to call it, to actually go, no, something else needs to happen here. And I heard that from your story. That happened in my story. And I think it's happened, Beverly, to you. I don't know. And that's where the shame comes from, though. Let's be frank here. The shame comes from, like you say, you know, oh, who wants, um, I remember one of the things my dad used to say, who wants to come to the shop? And I, would, wouldn't want to get in the car but and then a sibling would say oh I'll come with you and he would often ask a certain sibling and I'm not going to say names knowing that that sibling would say no and then rather than and then him inviting anyone else I'd just say I'll come with you mm -hmm. do you see what I mean and that's where the shame comes from because then we start to think even as young children it was our fault we take that responsibility. But not only that, you're in a position where you're trying to protect others because you're taking the abuse. Well, that's what you think at the time. Um, or you don't think that. With hindsight, you think that. But then you get the pe when you do speak up, you get the people say, well, why did you not speak up sooner? If you spoke up sooner, then so-and-so might have been protected. So you can't win either way. And you yeah. have to deal with all of this in your own little head, you know, as a child and then as an adult, you're like, you can't win. No. So, you know, you just got to do what's right for you. But recovery is completely, uh, can be very complicated because of all of these layers. Right, I'm yeah. going to be quiet now and let you go on <laughs> to the next question. No, I was just going to say, um, I never actually, in my case, never thought that it was my fault, but I had a lot of shame um for many different reasons but I never thought it was my fault I knew that it was his fault what he was doing was his fault he did it. he was the one being bad but I felt disgusting I felt um disgusting about the what was happening in the acts and I didn't like who I was I wasn't able to be who I am when I went to school I couldn't be who I am so a long way the shame changed for me, but I was ashamed of who I was at school. I was bullied and 
Um, I was ashamed of being a nice, kind person when I became free because I thought that being a nice, kind person meant being vulnerable and therefore abusable. But actually kindness and, and being vulnerable does not mean not safe. And it does not mean not strong. Being vulnerable means you're really strong. Oh, yeah. And it That's actually means you understand yourself so that you can protect yourself. Do you know like, when there was times when, you know, I'm speaking for you now, so jumping in. <laughs> but, you know, um, shortly after all this happened, you know, it became apparent very quickly because Emily then told me, because I'd ask her to, you know, make a choice on something and she said, I can't. You know, she hadn't been able to make a choice. Mm. So I, I kind of worked with you for a long time to help you make your choices. When I can remember singing to you the Bruno Mars songs, your um um about being beautiful. I can't remember the title of no over and over and over. It's just to help, try to help her realise how beautiful she was inside and out. Mm -hmm. But I'd sing that song over and over and over and over and um <laughs> You do all sorts of strange things just to try to help mm. start that processing of re reintroducing a different reality mm. into, into the. Um, I'm, I, I'm getting emotional. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you were my mum. Oh, I so wish you were my mum. <laughs> and I'm being 101% honest here because sadly, <laughs> I couldn't tell my mum until I was pregnant with my first child because we do need we'll, we'll move on a little bit here but I think it's been so valid everything that we've been speaking about and it means also that anyone watching the document gets all this behind the documentary gets all this behind as well but for me when we talk about triggers it was a huge trigger being pregnant because suddenly where I detached so much from my body and then I've got something inside my body I want to love them you know, as a mum that was you know, was pleased to be pregnant, but that was the last thing I wanted. So that was a trigger in itself. And when people say, you know, in lots of training that I do, et cetera, and they say, don't use triggering words. Hello? You obviously don't know what a trigger is then because <laughs> you yeah. won't speak or you won't do anything. So coming back to you, Emily, how did that feel when you were, you were pregnant yourself? Um, I remember worrying about having a girl, um, and because I was worried about the vulnerability of girls in life, and of course now I don't think that we can build women, um, girls to become strong and know how to protect themselves, and or at least be able to speak out if if they need that. But that's what I've also done for my son. You know, I needed to. And I still do um, help him always have the opportunity to speak to me. Um, so when I was pregnant, I was worried about having a girl. I was also grappling with trust around um, my partner at the time, um, my son's dad. And he had no, there was no reason for that. He's loyal, lovely, an amazing human, an amazing dad. Um, but uh I was worried the trust issues were coming up, you know, um, how can I leave my child? And um, and so I was I was worried during that, that whole time, but also excited about having a new baby. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I had my son, you know, people were just trying to throw themselves, can I hold your baby? One person got so upset that like you know I, they weren't able to hold the baby as and when they wanted and um I think I was going through the same challenges new mums and parents have anyway mm -hmm. with an added layer of trying to protect my child um but when they're a small baby and they're with you all the time it's fairly easy to protect them and I'm when I say you I am actually really me so I'm trying not to that's okay not to <laughs> put my um, stuff onto you but um, you know, having having him was was a big blessing, and um, it wasn't really until I started needing to leave him um, in the care of other people that it, it became very difficult. And especially when they're younger and they actually can't voice what might be happening, um, and when they're toddlers and going to nursery, I, find, I found that really really difficult. And actually. Um, 
I did remove him from one nursery because I noticed him and I, and I reported the nursery because I noticed him like pretending he was like two, pretending to like kiss the wall and he was just behaving differently. And so I took him out that straight away and I thought I'm going to protect him and make sure he's in a good and safe environment. Um, but like also navigating, like being a mum, one of the things that really used to, um, you know, be quite frank, piss me off a lot. <laughs> Um, was I'd hear people saying stuff like oh you know he's had a very difficult life and um I hope she doesn't put all her stuff onto my onto her child and I I would not like I'm very aware of my own stuff and no per parent is perfect no matter if they think they are or not or pretend they are on social media no parent's perfect um and all we do all we try and do is the best for our child but, you know, me worrying about keeping my child safe didn't make him worried. He didn't know I was worried about yeah. that. You know, I'm not putting my stuff onto him in that respect. Um, and that used to really annoy me. So I think there's a lot of sort of like survivor bias that goes on towards uh, parents. And actually, we're probably way more educated than you are. So maybe keep your opinions or try and listen to us about some education. And then... <laughs> You know, one I just the other day I was out for a, a dog walk um with my son, who is now seven, and um we were walking along and we I always just have a little chat with him about um, you know, you, you always have the opportunity just to talk to me. I go through the pants um thing from yeah. the NFPCC, um, always empower him to know that he can speak out. I explained to him about um good and bad. Um, grown-ups and um, I tell him in a very age-appropriate way that not all grown-ups are good and um, we need to we have the right to have good grown-ups around us and you can um, talk to me I'm just always listening to him as well and um, like for example he said he went to um, a, a summer camp recently and one of the um, teachers there was too friendly and yeah. of course I'm like I'm like oh god you know my head's ah yeah but, um he didn't mean too friendly in a sexual way or anything like that. The the chap just kind of put his hand onto his shoulder and and um in a kind of like way that, that you would, I suppose, as a, as a teacher like that. Um he just said it was too friendly for him and his boundaries, but I was like, good for you. You know what your boundaries are, you know how to speak about them. And I'm just so pleased about that. Um so yeah, I think I'm bringing my experience and trying to turn it into a positive in, in the way I educate and bring up my own child. Um, and I do feel uh, a lot better now as a, as a mum than perhaps at the beginning when I was, you know, very worried and, and things like that. One other thing that um, I haven't really shared too much, but being a mum when I was abused, I didn't really like to get too snuggly with my child. As a baby, it's fine, but you know how children um, have like body reactions and things like that. Little boys can um, get erections that mean, you know, it's just a functional thing as a, yeah. as a child um, and girls are, are very similar. I, I struggled with those normal bodily things that children have um you know and, and I just never want to put shame so it's all about education but for me I do have to take a breath and uh, go through a trigger in my body that's come up um and try and be the best mum through that um whilst you know, giving myself a bit of self-love and protection in the meantime. It's very difficult when you're so busy day to day to actually do that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and again, said so well. And I just need to remind everyone, we've got five minutes. And talking about triggers, someone might have seen me jump just then. So anyone watching this video probably saw me jump. My dog went to try and open the door. <laughs> <laughs> Mine did at the same time, yes. I think. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Can I just touch upon the physiological um, normal responses of our children? And you're, and you're saying, Emily, about all of that. Bev and I have spoken about this at length in other podcasts about our children growing up and how that impacted us and how we were 
trying not to be overprotective, but of course, I can speak from my own uh, example. I was completely overprotective. My children didn't go around and stay at other people's homes, for oh, yeah. example. Um, and also when my son, I've got a son and a daughter, and when my son was little and he got an infection in his private parts, again, I have a, uh, one of my triggers is the word, so I try not to use it. Um, I had to get his dad to sort that out because I couldn't do that because that's a trigger of mine. Um, so it's really hard not to try and put your stuff on your children, but by not being able to deal with an infection in their private parts as a mum and you're stepping back, I felt a bit of a failure as a mum because I couldn't do that. But I, I truly at the time could not do that. So my husband obviously had to step in and 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 just sort that out. And he thought it was silly that I couldn't sort it out. Oh. But we didn't understand that trauma impact. Well, then. I would what I would say, Chris, is actually rather than feeling like you're a failure, you are a hero then, because you did the right thing. And you, rather than bringing trauma to your child and re-traumatizing yourself, what you did was you put an intervention in, a safe one, to mm -hmm. um, you know, get that infection sorted. And yeah. you, know, you were able to manage your trauma aside of that. So don't feel don't feel bad about that. That was a good intervention. You have to but manage you know when you're doing those things day to day you don't understand what it is that you're doing yeah. try and manage it the best as you can and like my daughter she's obviously she's the same size as me uh, taller than me now I find it really hard when she became my size as a teenager I found that really difficult to give her hugs because especially if I'm not expecting it if she comes at the side or comes behind me I'm like oh don't do that so yeah. I have put some of my trauma onto my children because that I'm I'm sorry, but that just is sometimes not it can't be helped. So yeah. we've had conversations about it. It's not her, it's the situation. And if you want a hug, come at me from the front <laughs> and say, Can I have a hug, Mum? Because then that diffuses all of my subconscious. Ugh, and then I can deal with it. So I just wanted to put that out there that this is normal. Absolutely. Drivers. Yeah, absolutely. It's normal. You're going to come across something. And it's this education. I remember speaking with some midwives. So, so we always hear that breast is best um, for attachment for the baby and the health, etc. Absolutely understand it. As a parent, the last thing I wanted was for me to react to a newborn baby because I didn't want my ba my child anywhere near my breasts. Mm -hmm. And I remember even being ostracised by a midwife in the hospital and she refused to speak to me because I wouldn't breastfeed. She hadn't asked my story or anything. So I was making it for the right reasons from my perspective as a, a survivor because didn't want to put my trauma onto my child but it's the judgment of others when we already judge ourselves anyway hard enough yeah so I'm going to be the sorry Emily I actually just before we wrap up I want to make a different point um that I think is really important to speak about from a woman survivor's perspective coming to hormones and how that impacts periods but also post-traumatic stress well, um, no, postnatal depression, sorry. Yes. Because um, I actually had a bit of postnatal depression and your comment about breasts actually resonated with me. I, I did breastfeed my son for the first six weeks because he was premature and I needed to top him up. And I, I actually found that really difficult. I think, Bev, I felt a little bit, in my body didn't, I, I felt like probably triggered. Now you're yes. talking about it. Um, but in that, when, when we are children, you, I'm sure you'll know this, but um, as I lived most of my life in freeze, not fight or flight, or flight free, mm. I lived on adrenaline a lot. Um, and my it's impacted all my hormones. And so when I had my son, um, I, um, I'm actually really prone to um, hormone-related depression. And um, 
because of progesterone levels and yes. uh, my hormones not quite being in the right balance. And so when I had my son, I had to battle a bit of postnatal depression and it was really difficult. Um, and I'm lucky because I had a midwife actually that said, stop breastfeeding. It's just stop. You need to be there for your son and, and there for you. And that, but that was till, it wasn't until six weeks and it did help because my hormones settled a bit. But I think it's really important for anybody, you know, in this, in this community to realise not just the emotional and physical triggers, but the actual proper, like sort of physical um, outcomes, like on your hormones, um, impact being a parent mm. um, and to know you're not alone and to seek help. But you need the midwives and, and the professionals to actually listen to you. You need to, people need to listen to the child who's a victim. They also need to listen to the adult who's a survivor. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So we get one last thought, everybody. I'm just coming to you, Chris. Everybody gets one last thought as we wrap up. I also want to just say to anybody watching or listening, please look after yourself. We all will when we're finished here anyway please look after yourself and we will put the details of the documentary underneath so you, what you've heard today is a fantastic background and the documentary itself is so well done and it's a, a, a documentary that I will watch again and again I don't know about anyone else so Chris what's your last thoughts on today before we go around the room as I was going to say part two Emily and Kathy, because we've not even scratched the surface. There we go. <laughs> it's what I say. We need a part two. Are you up for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Do you know what would be good is to get yes. us compile a load of questions and reactions from the community. Yep. Both it'd be nice to hear from both survivors and families of survivors and people that uh, maybe haven't uh, understand much about um the world of abuse and and bring that into the conversation as well absolutely 100 percent. because there's things um about my pregnancy and birth that I could have brought in but we've already done a podcast mm. on that so I tried to keep sharp but everything that you've explained what that was going on for you and Beverly's explained and I've explained it is normal for lots of victim and survivors, but it's just the professionals that need that understanding, that training and that insight so that they can respond to us in a different way. Um, but also, obviously, then there's after giving birth and all of that. There's your relationships with different people that I want to ask you about, Emily and Kathy. There's an um, impact on your life. And what's next? I want to talk about all of that. That's why I need a part two, Bev. <laughs> so let's come to you Kathy because you've been sitting there so patiently and I can't say thank you enough for the honesty for both of you and your relationship shines through Kathy what's your last thought before we finish today well, my last thought is you know Emily chose to um you know, relinquish her anonymity, I can't never say that word, anonymity, <laughs> um, to to start a conversation. And, you know, this is part of that ongoing conversation which we want to keep going. And, you know, my, my gratitude for today is one to Emily for, you know, being patient with me when I say the wrong words and do the wrong things occasionally. <laughs> um, and to, you know, to, for us to, the journey we've been on to get to where we are but I also want to be very grateful to my friends at the time who were people, again, who, who hadn't dealt with anything like this, who were picking up a very traumatised person who was trying to be a rock in a family of traumatised people to try to just keep the day-to-day -day stuff going. And because I didn't have the professional support around me, it just wasn't, I couldn't find it. Yeah. And... Um, so I just want to put a real grateful thank you to them because, you know, they helped navigate me. I was broken. I was trying to be the rock for, you know, not be, not show my brokenness as a rock. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I was too. So, yeah, yeah. thank you to all of them. And thank you yeah. to you. Yeah. Thank you, Cathy. And Emily, what are your last thoughts? I know there's loads going on, but what are your last thoughts? Um, I think it's just really simple. Um, it's 
let's be a community. Let's um, everybody be a community together to actually turn negatives into a positive and step forward to break the cycle. Um, and, you know, it's not just breaking the cycle, but it's actually blossoming something that was even more wonderful. And it's truly possible. And it's not, life's not always rosy anyway. But, um, <laughs> it certainly can be a lot more than it ever was. So thank you to, to you for inviting us on and having us on. Thank you to coming, coming to the Channel 4 and NSPCC event. Um, and I think I will take the moment as many times as I can to thank everybody who, you know, who participated in my documentary. Um, I did it because I've worked on TV for many years and I, I wanted to use those skills to educate the wider public, actually not survivors, the wider public. Um, and, you know, my mum and uh, my friends and people that you don't actually see on the documentary came forward and, and did that. We all volunteered, you know, we all, we all did it voluntarily. And it was hard, but it, it was so important. So thank you to my community, to your community for listening. I hope you didn't blabble on too much um, <laughs> and you will enjoy part two. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I thought you best. <laughs> <laughs> well my last thoughts is you know I keep saying thank you and that thank you goes to you both obviously you know the people listening and the people watching because this conversation can only grow with the more people that want to get involved in it and I think one of the biggest messages that has come from me today that I just want to reiterate to people don't be afraid about saying the wrong thing because if it's said with love, the wrong thing, we'll help educate you. And that education never stops because we're still learning about ourselves. Yeah. You know, different triggers can come out of anywhere. So we just want to say thank you for honesty because I think that's the biggest thing that we all want anyway. So anyone who has any questions, you can contact us through email breaking the cycle to step forward at gmail.com we're on facebook we're on instagram we're on twitter you can message us as um kathy and emily have so generously said you know we'll consider um, and work out a day for them to come back and we record part two so if there's something you want to ask please put it in my tin and we will also have the link underneath for, yes, the NSPCC, also for the One in Four charity. Also, um, I'm going to put the Family Matters charity in because that was the first charity I reached out to when I very first started my recovery. But most importantly, the link to the documentary. Exactly. So on that note, it's time to say goodbye to everybody. Let's all give a wave, say goodbye. Please look after yourselves and thank you for listening.